bring up the chat in case I need it. Cool. All up and running. Anywho. Looks like there is a major breach for hospitals. Yay. I just retweeted it. Mm, that's not for me. Another an offline SHA one has been leaked. That's fun. Another wave of COVID infections on the rise. Humble Bundle put out another another set of stuff, mostly around uh, coding. I typically go for those, but not this time. I'll wait for another hacking. Ooh, Shodan has a new beta website. That's cool. There's a hack to show where the International Space Station is with your NES. Huh. You can get an Arduino with PWM outputs and a network connection and then access an API and make it just point servos at wherever the ISS is right now. That's cool. Have you guys seen that uh, that new ring camera that's a drone? Yeah, it looks pretty interesting. I think they said it's supposed to be coming out next year, correct? Yeah, something like that. That's pretty cool. That'd be interesting. That first one, they uh, were talking about it because I heard about it over uh, the radio. I thought it was like a drone that was outside of your home. 
But then once I saw the commercial, it actually sits on a base in your house. And then I guess if you're if you have a ring alarm and it detects that there's an intrusion or something, I guess it'll fly around and try to get uh, get it on on video. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, the EFF is already against it. Oh, really? Why is that? Because it it upends the very idea of home as a private place. Because go figure, the ring is connected out to the internet. So if anybody can get access to the ring device, they can they can control it and fly the thing around your house and now know what's inside your house. Right. So are they looking? Are they more concerned at it because of the uh, security aspect of it? I guess. Yeah. Got it. Which no, would be, that makes sense. Which is my uh, my thing too with any IoT devices. It's probably lacking in security. Right, right. No, I agree. Needless to say, though, it's a pretty interesting device. I mean, yeah, that that definitely is true. It's definitely an interesting device. Just knowing what happens. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait a little wait a little while until I see what all the flaws are, and then I might think about getting one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I actually have I, I have the uh, the ring alarm system at home, um, and I when I saw that I was like, no, oh, that'd be interesting. But then once I gave it some more thought, I was like, well, you know, I, I've heard of people's ring cameras actually being hacked before, so I wouldn't doubt if they can do the same thing with the drone. Mm -hmm. All right. Well. Yeah, that would be great. Having a drone buzz, someone who broke into your house. <laughs> uh, at least stick a laser or something on it. Yeah. I wonder how that would work uh, if you have pets inside. I wonder if they have some kind of uh, algorithm so that it detects the difference between uh, somebody breaking in your house, I guess, a human and an and actual pet. Right. Who knows? Um, oh, it's already two o'clock. Time flies when you're having fun. All right. Welcome to module number five. Uh, if you are looking at Canvas, you will notice that we have our two lessons, as we have done, but no lab. And that is on purpose because A, we're finished with the one book, and B, it gives you a week to catch up if you've fallen behind, because life happens, and I want to be cognizant of that. So this week, it's really two lectures, the lecture review, and the quiz. Um, no labs this week. So the uh, two subjects of this week are pretty much like introductory into what we'll cover in the next set of weeks, and that is more dealing with the server. Uh, first off is Active Directory, the database that Windows uses for all devices that are connected into one domain, which is basically think of a domain as a group. Uh, it's a more centralized group than a work group. Uh, it's normally managed and controlled by servers. Uh, to tend to be the called domain controllers. So rather than being a DHCP server or a DNS server, a domain controller is the one who handles anything related to the domain itself. So like I said, a domain is your central database that all users and computers and other devices that are uh, interconnected into this group access. It as system admins, this thing is great because it we, we can manage everything from one place rather than going to many different places to manage. Uh, each domain has its own organizational units or OUs. These can be further divided out. So if we wanted to, for example, take the marketing group, the accounting, uh, our sales, our IT, our, our C-suite, we can put each and every one of those into a separate organizational unit to apply different permissions and rules to each and every. Uh, so we have finer control over who does what or who has access to what. 
This is what uh, Active Directory has looked like for pretty much forever today through the MMC. You can use group policies on organizational units. So you are able to uh, have a specific group who can do things and set all that up to the group policy and have specific group policies that affect either a certain OU or affect the entire domain. There is this odd uh, analogy of trees and forests. So every, every domain is its own tree and you can put these different domains together kind of like a, like a super net in networking uh, into a forest. The thing about forests is they share trust with each other. So a user who is on europe.ad.giganticlife.com is able to communicate with asia.ad.giganticlife.com or also able to communicate with sales.enormouslife because these two domains are, are trusting each other. And with that trust established, one user can connect to another user uh, across the network. So if somebody from here uh, wants to log in to the, to the sales stuff on this side, they're able to because these domains all trust each other. Within Active Directory, you have a couple more roles that exist. So certain users are able to do uh, certain roles. Member servers are anybody, any, any physical Windows server who is not necessarily a domain controller but is part of the domain can participate in things like sharing files and printers and, and providing access. Uh, your Active Directory should be divided into manageable units and things that are, you know, you don't want to put everybody in just one OU. You want to divide everything out so that it's much more easier to handle uh, users in, you know, users in the right groups and systems in the right groups and so on and so forth. Active Directory can replicate itself. So if you have multiple sites, Active Directory can also copy itself out. Uh, so you have redundancy. So uh, you have login faster. Because can you imagine if you have an office in Santa Cruz and you have another office in Hong Kong and they use the same Active Directory server, the Hong Kong people are going to take a while to log in. But if you have replication on, then they'll be able to log in faster with the same information at both. Normally, when you install Active Directory and you turn a server into a domain controller, DNS will also install with it uh, in order to be able to do uh, any uh, domain name stuff. For, for example, if a, a new computer wants to join the network, uh, because DNS is local, Active Directory is able to resolve those addresses quickly so users are able to log in and resources are able to be brought up faster. Joining, uh, isn't there an Active Directory server built into FreeNAS? I don't know if there's one built into FreeNAS. Uh, joining a domain is pretty simple. A domain administrator has to join that machine to the network. It has to, they have to enter their credentials in order to get authenticated and enter uh, the domain. Then the system has to restart. Once a computer is part of the domain, a account is made for it. Um, it also synchronizes time with the domain controller. So you want to ensure that domain controller is using something, uh, you know, uh, something reputable like UTC or using a, a good NTP that's on all the time. Uh, like I mentioned, group policy is your central place to manage Windows. 
and be able to do that. And, and through domain, uh, through a domain, you can create your group policy and have it populate out to all your clients without having to touch them. Here's the group policy manager. Make your own folder and you can make your own policies there that will apply to whatever OU you want. Uh, the group policy is divided out into settings that will affect the users and settings that will affect the computers. Uh, anything that you, know, you can you can subdivide it out or you can put it all in one. Uh, but the whole point is to be able to uh, uh, fine grain manage all your users and computers from one central place. If you have an OU within an OU, um, you can, uh, the group policy settings will inherit. So here is the order. A local computer will get the GPO, then the site, then the domain, then the parent, then the child. So if there are any GPOs applied locally, that's gonna take, uh, that's gonna take first precedence. Then the site, then the domain, then the parent OU, then the child OU. So when you uh, are creating a group policies, you want to you want to be cognizant of the list and the order in which these OUs get applied. So that if you're wondering why is this setting not taking effect, well, did you set it to the domain? Did you set it to the child OU? Where where is that GPO? Because there's an order. And all local computers have their own local policy. So if the local policy is in any way contradicting any of the others, it's not going to take effect. Of course, you can apply more than one GPO to each computer or user. Um, if, uh, if there is a conflict between the two, the later one overwrites any earlier. Again, those preferences are pushed down to the computers as part of the group policy update. Uh, and it is, uh, it is easier to manage the, the systems through group policy because you have all the possible settings. You don't have to create scripts and hope that it works. You know that the setting will be applied through group policy because all of Windows understands a group policy. There are quite a number of things that you can do like the OBDC enabling and disabling devices or adding printers, mapping drives, uh, having a scheduled task set, any, uh, any particular service on, off, disabled, enabled, uh, setting up any VPNs and even registry keys. All these things can be configured through the group policy. It's a pretty powerful way of controlling systems. Uh, again, you can create local policies and multiple of them, just like you can create domain, uh, multiple domain policies. So you can create a policy when a user is in the network and when the user is out and the computer will be able to determine which to apply. Through group policy, we can do things like saying, you know what, no user can use any USB systems because uh, we don't trust USB drives. They're probably infected because we don't want users to exfiltrate any data out that we don't sanction or because we just don't want anyone access with USB, for example. It's completely possible to manage all that in GPO. Uh, we can we can do even things like what hardware ID uh, string a hardware will take. So we can say uh, only these sanctioned USB devices or these USB drives from Samsung will be able to plug in because we trust these. And anything that's built by somebody else is not allowed. You, you can be that, that fine grain with a group policy.
And that's where you get some of that information. So you would take uh, some of this and put it into group policy and say only this kind of drive is accepted. Here's where you set that up. So in group policy, it's under administrative templates, under system, under device installation, you'll find that folder. Kind of buried, uh, but it is there. Anything that's removable storage. So yes, we have tape drives. Yes, we have floppies. That stuff is still there. Um, as mentioned a while ago, we talked that there are some tools you can use to deploy Windows 10 over the network or by like a disk drive in order to get things quickly out the door. You have the user state migration tool, great for migrating users from one system to another. Creates a, a nice package that you can import and export. Uh, like the classic cassette drives registered to the system different than those 42 terabyte LTO drives. Uh, I think those are similar. Uh, the process for the user state migration is pretty simple. It's actually a nice uh, wizard that you can use to pick and choose what users you want to back up and what do you want to copy out? And it collects all that information and puts it all together for you. And then you can just go to the other system and, uh, and bring back the, the profile with everything. So on one side, it'll be the scan state and the other side will be the load. You can, see, you can edit some changes in the XML files that exist. Uh, for the most part, you won't need to, but just in case, you can open up those XML files and see the settings uh, that exist. Windows deployment, another way to get Windows out and about to systems. For this, you'll need Active Directory, you'll need DHCP, DNS, and a NTFS partition on the server hosting the images for Windows. So you'll have various images like the install, uh, the boot, the capture, and the discover. In order to use this, your end devices will need to have Pixie boot on. So they'll get, when they turn on, they'll get an IP address. They'll uh, ask the DHCP server, where do I get my image from? It'll get it from the WDS server through Pixie boot. It'll download the image, run it in RAM, and out you go. So as long as those systems are able to boot over the network, you could deploy Windows versions out. SCCM, another solution that'll handle things like inventory, software development, uh, software updates, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the MDT can be used with the SCCM and WDS. It's more of a scripting uh, application for you. Again, just more ways of not touching the end devices, but controlling everything from the server. It is possible to boot uh, from a VHD, boot a virtualized desktop environment. couple more management tools, the Microsoft Desktop Optimization Pack. And these names just roll off the tongue, don't they? This handles things like the user experience virtualization and BitLocker. There is the Windows Server Update Service. Uh, this thing will handle all updates 
So instead of going to Microsoft itself to get updates, your, uh, your workstations can get their updates from this specific server. Could be faster because it's local instead of going out to the internet. Um, could be dangerous because if somebody infects the update server, they could put malware into those updates and have it propagate out to your entire network. Of course, with, as with anything, you should always test your updates to make sure that they will work and not break other stuff before you go out and about deploying them. So this is one good way to get the updates, test them before putting them out. So you can see it's a, it's a process. MBAM for BitLocker admin and monitoring. Great if we have machines who go out and about like laptops, we can ensure that at least the drives are encrypted. So if and when the device gets stolen, at least our data is safe. Uh, same with UEV. For our machines that have roaming profiles, they can provide user state virtualization. So are those settings will stay synchronized as the user goes out and about. Got to configure it in group policy. The two big settings are the setting storage location and settings template catalog location. There is also the distributed distribute file system or DFS uh, in order to help users in a large organization with multiple locations be able to access things like map drives so servers can share with each other uh, the data. So for this, you'll need servers to replicate and namespaces so uh, everybody can keep all the servers can uh, know what you know what data is where. Great for data backup, great for high availability, and great to, uh, for multiple locations. So we have our one share, the true location, ad gigantelife.com slash share staff marketing, but these two servers are uh, replicating everything that's here and with each other. This way, any users that are connected to server one still get the same data as they would in server two. But if these two servers are in two different geographic locations, they're still up to date, still in sync. And we slow, we bring down the amount of time it'll take for our users at both sides to access data. That's in our corporate office, wherever that is. Um, as because we're talking network, they need to have a DNS namespace. They need to have a, a single file structure so that it's easy to be replicated and be able to share files without impacting any other users. It makes life easier. Here are some of the settings that you get. Branch cache. It's another way of doing kind of the same thing, but branch cache works in locations or so it should be used in locations that have slower internet access. So it will cache the data locally using uh, BITS, the Background Intelligent Transfer Service, in order to uh, use the minimal amount of data to get information in and out for users. So you have, you have two ways. You can do it either by the distributed file system, which again will be, is great when we have high-speed internet and multiple sites. And then for those sites who don't have high-speed internet, you could use branch cache. Any questions?
So let's make that into a video. Yep. What was that service called that you were talking about last week that puts your Active Directory server on Microsoft servers? It puts Active Directory on Microsoft? That's, that's the domain controller. Oh, OK. All right. Uh, um, So would it be possible to have a Windows server local that is um, mirrored to Microsoft's Azure cloud so that remote devices can go through the cloud and use Microsoft infrastructure and local devices don't have to go oh, yeah. out of your network? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Azure has definitely uh, been working on that. Uh, so that you can have a local server and a cloud server and the two are synced. That would be really useful to not put so much load on your ISP for like a computer lab getting all its users initialized or something. Right, yeah. Yeah, Microsoft has done that through Azure. Ninety percent done. There's the file, put it up here. That was chapter 13, I believe. Yep. Oops. Wrong account. Switch account. No wonder I was like, wait, where's all my playlist? Okay. Chapter 13 on 194. Not made for kids. Public, publish. You know how Windows is perpetually supporting really old systems? Yeah. Does Windows 10 support loading DOS games from a cassette tape player through a microphone input the way that DOS did? Oh, I have no idea if, it, if that works anymore. Interesting. I haven't messed with DOS and Eon, so I have no idea. OK, video is going up so we can continue. All right. Last chapter to finish the first half of the two books that we're going through. All about remote access and how do people from the outside are able to get in without, um, and without making huge holes on our networks. The best way 
would be a VPN because it creates a encrypted connection from our infrastructure out to specific end users. The, uh, you know, with the VPN, a computer will act as though it is in the network. And in a way it is because we're making this encrypted connection from them to us so that they can interact with our infrastructure without physically being there. Uh, remote control has been something that uh, sys admins use all the time to help uh, people out. Because if you've ever, if you've ever done any tech support, you know that a user always starts with something vague, like the computer doesn't work or the internet doesn't work. And you have to ask follow-up questions to get detailed information to find out that all that they really mean is Microsoft Word is not booting or not starting fast enough, or the browser is really slow because they have X, Y, and Z plugins. Um, you know, it. Uh, our users are not tech savvy and not really expected to be tech savvy. So um, a remote control helps in seeing what they see and being able to take control quickly, if, especially if we're not there, like, no. But again, through a secure network, being able to take remote control. Data synchronization, another, uh, another use of a VPN in order for users to interact with data, they could store it locally if you trust them and then have it synchronized back out to us. Server 2016 and above can be, uh, can be turned into a remote access server. But just as uh, this note, that a lot of organizations use non-Microsoft solutions, but you can just like you can turn uh, Windows into a router, you can turn Windows into a VPN server. Uh, all end devices like a Windows desktop and Linux and Mac all can be VPN clients. There are a couple protocols that are available to you if you're using Windows as your VPN server. There is the outdated and one you should not use, TPTP. I don't know why they still support it other than backwards compatibility, but you don't want that available at all. Should use something like layer two tunneling. It's much more secure that uses things like Kerberos in order to authenticate users. This is something that's more recommended. Uh, you can also use SSTP or Ike version two, but uh, definitely don't use PPTP at all. Creating a VPN connection is pretty similar uh, to creating a new network connection. You need the, uh, the right info in place, like what server you're connecting to, the type of VPN, uh, the username and password. If the users are on the network, you can use group policy to get out the, uh, the VPN information without them having to know any of it. Just deploy it through GPO, let it update to their computers and done. Don't have to worry about settings or anything. Um, there's a couple of protocols that come with it. Again, you don't want to use the outdated stuff like CHAP. You want to use a newer version like MS CHAP version two. Because if at any point you misconfigure and use older uh, protocols, 
an attacker may realize that and use downgrade attacks and get in. And then so much for having a VPN. Uh, direct access behaves like a VPN, doesn't require them to turn on a connection. It is easier for use, but if you've ever taken any of my security classes, you know that uh, anything that's higher convenience, lower security. So VWare. Uh, user authentication is ha happens in the background. If you have NLS on, then I feel better. If you don't have that on, um, yikes. Uh, you can configure direct access through GPO. That is completely possible. Just like a lot of other settings you can do from GPO. Uh, if I haven't mentioned this enough, I'll mention it again. Don't use RDP. It's vulnerable. There is exploit code out for any remote desktop server who is publishing port 3389 out to the world. Don't use RDP, use something else. Um, the, I think there is one in the server. So in the next couple of weeks. Because this is still looking at everything from the, from the uh, desktop point of view. So, uh, so yeah, so even though RDP is built into Windows, um, please don't use it. I don't, I don't want to find out that you got breached because of RDP. So I keep repeating on it. Please don't use it. You're able to load local resources out to the connection. So like uh, your, uh, your Windows desktop can share folders with that RDP connection. So the uh, other end can get to your local system. Again, red alert, red alert, because that sounds beautiful to get malware from your local system onto the other end. You have all these settings that are supposed to keep the system secure, but the uh, the protocol is insecure. So it kind of renders all this moot. Please don't use RDP. Um, remote assistance, you know, I have not gotten remote assistance to work outside of a LAN. I've had it work within a LAN but not outside. But it's basically a internal RDP where you can uh, control another, another system. So you ask for help, you get a little code, you connect to it, and now you can see and do anything. Since we're talking remote, synchronizing data is always something remote, especially for our users today who are all working from home. Do they use uh, their local resources or do they have to connect out to our infrastructure to do any, any work? You could use something like OneDrive that's interwebbed into all the, the latest window stuff. You could also use offline files, which has been around to do the same. And sync any data from local out. You can use uh, work folders as well, the, uh, defined by URLs. So again, these are facing out to the world.
you can use group policy if the system is joined to the domain and apply these work folders. So you have to log in and then they can see whatever folders they're being shared. Um, like I said, this week, we covered these two chapters. You only have the lecture review and the quiz. You do not have any labs this week. So you have some extra time if you've fallen behind in any of the prior labs to catch up so that you're ready to handle module six next week. Are there any questions? Cool. Oh, I do see a message of uh, the new name for direct access. Oh, off the top, I had that in a note and I believe it has slipped my mind. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. There was a question earlier about DreamSpark access. According to Marcelo, you have access to it by using the email you provided to Cabrillo. So if you're a Cabrillo student, you should be able to access DreamSpark with your email. And I also saw another link that was posted by another student about the, uh, the Microsoft Ignite challenges. I don't know what they mean by Microsoft certification. I don't know if they're just handing out uh, the, what is it called, the MCSAs. Their, their facts don't really say what kind of cert you get, but it sounds cool if you're interested in that kind of stuff. The link is already in Discord, and you can see it there uh, on my address bar. If it's a voucher for an exam, that's awesome too. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you have, I believe, off, up to October 7 to register. Yes. Oh, no, you got to log in and complete the modules before October 7. So there's, uh, there's something new. Thank you for sharing. If you have any other links to share, please go ahead and put them in Discord uh, to help each other out. 